All right, so welcome everyone to our astronomy lab. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and remind you that if you're here on Twitch, don't forget to hit the follow button and think about subscribing if you want to help me meet my goals this month. Um, if you're watching on YouTube after the fact, please hit the like button and subscribe for notifications when new videos are posted. That really just kind of helps me uh, keep everything going and, uh, and I appreciate all the support. Um, so today, we are going to be talking about um, what's in the night sky right now. And then we had a few questions from people on um, quasars and solar activity. So I'm going to try to condense these now to about 30 minutes. Um, I got some feedback from people that was really useful. And I really appreciate that um, the, uh, the hour <laughs> uh, was a lot, especially to uh, watch after the fact, um, which I completely understand and appreciate. And uh, I mean, I'll hang out as long as we have people who want to ask questions, but if you, um, but if you're here just to learn, then we'll, we'll try to aim for about half an hour. So um, first we're going to talk about what's kind of in the night sky this week. So I have this set to LA and uh, the Griffith Observatory, <laughs> the infinite, infamous Stellarium farmland of Los Angeles. <laughs> um, but it is uh, Mother's Day. So one of our famous sort of matrons of mythology is Cassiopeia. So Cassiopeia is in the night sky about north right around sunset. This is about eight o'clock. Um, it is a circumpolar um, object, which means it goes around the North Pole. So I can uh, get rid of well, let me just fast forward through time and you can kind of see what Cassiopeia does. So that's the one right over here. And we're just going to jump forward in time. So it got dark and you can see it circles around this point here. This is our North star and that's our polar axis. So if you want to watch Cassiopeia, you can see it here. Um, and particularly right after sunset, it's almost directly North if you don't have the ground <laughs> or if you're at a slightly higher latitude. So, um, so you can see Cassiopeia up there, which is pretty cool. Um, the other thing is that the moon was full last night. If any of you were able to go out and see it, it's going to be waning now. So it's over the course of the next week, it's going to get to, um, a half moon and, uh, it, so the moon will rise later as it starts to go through its, its cycle. So if you want to observe fainter objects, if you have a telescope, then make sure you head out earlier in the evening before the moon rises, because then it gets harder to see. So, um, kind of right after sunset is a good time to, good time to head outside and, and do some observing. Um, the other thing too, is that, let me see if I can find it. We're going to head to Saturn and get rid of the ground. So Saturn right now through its cycle is um, kind of at its furthest point. So it's going to start tracing itself back during the sky. Remember the name planets is named such because they are wanderers. Hey, <laughs> good to have you here. Um, because wanderers, because compared, you know, night to night, um, compared to the stars in the back, they move throughout the sky. So Saturn is currently kind of at its furthest point. It's going to start moving back across the stars day to day. Um, but because of that, it's actually really good to uh, be able to observe its moons. So if you have a telescope that would be able to see Saturn's moons, now is a good time to see it. Um, and then as well around, let me see, around midnight between the 13th and the 14th. So let me get back out here. Let's jump forward to the 13th, 14th ish. And we'll say about midnight. Let's see where the ground is here. So it's a little bit below the horizon for us, but if you have an opportunity, Ganymede, one of Jupiter's moons is actually going to transit in front. Hey Zach. Um, it's going to transit in front of Jupiter. So you have a chance to observe that as well, um, between the 13th and the 14th. So if it is in your view, be sure to head on out and, uh, you can, 
observe that. It will happen over the course of like hours. So you got to be ready for it. But um, definitely look that up and check that out. So that's sort of the big highlights in the night sky that is happening this week. Now let's head to some of the questions that we got. So let me hide this and we are going to bring up this image. So this is uh, the image of a quasar. I brought up quasars a couple weeks ago when we were doing this and we had a few questions from people. So we're going to talk really briefly on what quasars are. And if you're dropping it right now, I um, kind of set up at the top that we're going to start condensing these to about half an hour worth. I appreciate not everyone can devote an hour to geeking out about astronomy. Um, but one of the fun things that we're going to start doing is um, I dug out my old textbooks from when I used to teach Astronomy 101. So I think maybe starting next week, we'll just kind of start progressively going through Astronomy 101 in half hour increments. So if you're interested in taking that, auditing an Astronomy 101 class, uh, we'll start doing that next week, I think. So stay tuned for that. Yay! <laughs> you're welcome. Um, I'm excited to do that. I really like teaching Astronomy 101 and, uh, and it helps if we kind of sequentially go through things. So we'll probably structure it kind of like this where we'll do kind of night sky and then a half hour course on Astronomy 101 and then kind of just do that every single week. There won't be assignments. There won't be grades. <laughs> so don't worry there, but it's going to be fun. So quasars. Now, uh, quasars were discovered back in the 60s when we first started getting radio telescopes up and going. Oh, question. Um, <laughs> as, as much as it can count towards you going back to school. <laughs> At the very least, Astronomy 101 will be really easy. Uh, but I can't, uh, I am not an accredited class. <laughs> My Twitch channel isn't. So good. I'm glad. It's going to be really fun. I'm very excited to bring Astronomy 101 to people. Like I said, I love teaching it and uh, even all the way through Astronomy 102. Um, so you won't need a textbook. You won't need anything. We will do it in half hour increments and it should be easy. We'll record it. We'll put it online so you can watch after the fact. And uh, yeah, it's a, it is an option for a lot of people's electives because I had a lot of students in Astronomy 101 who were uh, taking it as a science credit and then really disappointed that they had to do math. <laughs> so I get it. Uh, you can definitely get a textbook anyway if you want. Uh, we're going to use the Cosmic Perspective. That's the one that I have. Um, and I will not be breaking any licensing rules. It will be like this conversation and with helpful images, but I'm going to use that kind of as a structure to go through things. So yeah, it's going to be really fun. Uh, but until then, we can just kind of continue jumping around a little bit. Um, so quasars, like I said, were discovered back when they had uh, started doing radio astronomy in the 60s, setting up radio telescopes, pointing them specifically at the stars to try to observe in the radio band. So recall, radio waves are the lowest um, frequency, the lowest, yeah, lowest frequency, um, lowest energy longest wavelength, electromagnetic spectrum. Um, <laughs> I, vampire films, mm, I would take vampire films. <laughs> One of my favorite summer electives was, um, was uh, uh, gothic horror. That was really fun. So anyway, I love it. Um, and it's about time for summer school. So this is perfect. But when they started pointing radio telescopes back up at the sky, they saw things that looked like stars, really bright, bright points in the sky. And they were like, what? And they were called, <laughs> that's okay. They were called uh, quasi-stellar radio sources because it looked like stars in the radio spectrum, but then it wasn't looking like stars in the optic spectrum with the type of telescopes that we could have. So you can look at this image here. This is, um, an enhanced image since then, they called them quasi-stellar radio sources. And then in a paper in 1964, the author was basically like, so I don't want to write quasi-stellar radio source over and over again, so we're going to shorten it to quasar. <laughs> and that's where that name came from. Um, since then, we have actually discovered that they are at the center of galaxies. They are a form of active galactic nuclei. 
they still appear kind of like stars if you are so this is an image of a quasar that's here in the center and you can actually see kind of off to the bottom right a little bit like a jet that's coming out of it um so it's a form of what we call active galactic nuclei so if you have a spiral galaxy in the center of it we have supermassive black holes and these black holes, if it's kind of a young, like super active, there's a lot of stuff going on, you're going to have a lot of material like falling into this black hole and that's going to be radiating a ton of energy. And um, if you remember your uh, uh, angular momentum stuff, so if you remember that, you have stuff spiraling around, you're going to get this vector that points up the right hand rule. So if you imagine sort of the palm of my hand being the center of the galaxy, the center of the black hole, as stuff is like falling around it, you get this jet of energy that's going directly up and directly down to account for the angular momentum and conservation of energy and physics, essentially. Um, physics conservation. So you get these huge jets of energy that are shooting out of a... Um, out of the center of a galaxy. Now, it's important to note they are not being shot out of the black hole. Remember, nothing can escape a black hole, but it is uh, the heat and energy of everything that's going around it that's falling into it that's really hot and radiating a ton. Thank you, Stardom. Um, so that's where these active galactic nuclei are coming from, and quasars are a form of that. Now, quasars are actually like some of the furthest away sources that we can see, the furthest back in time, because remember, it takes light time to reach us. So if we're seeing things from very far away, that means that it was very far back in time. Um, and I know that's really hard to wrap your mind around, but I promise we'll kind of spend some more time as we get into Astronomy 101 itself, taking that point home, because it is, it is hard to kind of wrap our head around. But these objects are very far in the past. And um, what we think is that they are, yeah, stellar ghosts is a good way to put it. But early on in our universe, things were a lot closer together. Galaxies were kind of merging and forming. Um, it was a little bit more compact. So collisions and merging and merges and all of those were more commonplace. So in the center of galaxies, you were getting a lot more activity. And so these active galactic nuclei, these really bright energy sources were happening earlier in our universe. And, uh, and, and quasars is one of them. Now another, so we have active galactic nuclei or AGN. Uh, again, the same thing. Quasar is the same thing. Uh, we typically will just use quasar as like a type of AGN that is in the radio um, frequency. Um, and then the uh, blazar is another term for it and where it's pointing directly at us. So when we talk about that galaxy that has an active galactic nuclei jet coming out of it, that's if the jet is pointed directly at us. It's a blazar because it really blazes and it shows up in a lot of stuff. So um, these are used for various things. Not only can we just study the active galactic nuclei themselves, but um, you can actually use these as point sources in the background to be able to image these. So um, this is a picture from the uh, uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey that measures all these quasars. This is a artist's rendition, hey Brad, um, of a quasar, so very pretty. <laughs> but you can see this, uh, so this is a supermassive black hole that has these jets shooting out of it. And it's just really hot and bright. And it's imaged in the radio spectrum as well as across the board. And we can use these as light sources. One of the things I actually used quasars in my early, early research days to search for cold clouds of hydrogen gas that were between the quasar and us. So you can think of it like if the quasar was like a um, light pole, a source of light, maybe a um, like on a street, like a street lamp. And then between us, there is a, um, oh, that's okay. Life happens. Uh, in between us and the uh, lamp post, a uh, fog passes, right? Now imagine it's pitch black. You wouldn't see the fog if there wasn't light there. You wouldn't know that there was a cloud of fog going between us and this lamppost unless the lamppost was bright. 
And so you can think about these quasars as those lampposts. Um, yeah, so the the question is, is why you use a quasar specifically because it's really bright? Yes, one, because it's really bright. And so you have this like base light curve that if something passes in front of it, you're going to see a little dip. If something is not as bright, then it's maybe not going to dim it as much. So if you just think about like if your light is really bright, it'd be easier to see fog pass between us. And if it's really dim, it might be a little bit harder to see that. The other thing is that these are pretty they're really far away. So that's the other nice thing about this is because they're really far away, there's a lot of space between us and them that allows for things to pass through. Um, so the question from Muhammad is how does hydrogen travel as a cloud in space and not dissipate? That's a really good question. And it really is just gravity. It can be one of the things is we actually don't know how many just cold hydrogen clouds are out there. And what the source of those necessarily are. The idea is, is that maybe if you had a, for example, like a star forming region that you get these big, big nebulas, <laughs> um, that, oh, thank you. Um, seven what quasars? No, there's more than the seven quasars clouds. Um, let me know what you're talking about there, but these clouds are going to have some, bit of gravity associated with them. Um, so they are going to, it's really just the gravity, how much mass is there and then how there's obviously going to be a threshold at which point like the, it'll get torn apart. Um, oh, hydrogen two clouds. <laughs> gotcha. Hydrogen clouds. There's really not that many. So the research I was doing as an undergrad was trying to figure out in our local universe, which is, you know, outside of our galaxies, but fairly close by, you wouldn't say sort of early universe, um, stuff that was relatively close to us. Using these quasars as backgrounds, we, I think we imaged thousand, tens, almost 10,000 quasars. I think it was like 8,000 quasars and those line of sight to try to see if there was anything there. And we found one that had already been found before. <laughs> so there's really not a lot of these just kind of cold clouds hanging out. Um, there's lots of things that we could think of might have caused them. They're very hard to detect. So when it comes to how they stay as clouds and don't dissipate, it really just has to do with how dense they are and if they're dense enough to not really heat up, but, um, and also not get pulled apart by other sources of gravity. So it's kind of where that comes from. So my just really brief, recap of kind of how we used quasars was essentially we had like a radio survey and any points that we saw dips, we would look behind those dips in that direction to see if there was a quasar there that would be a source of light that would cause this dip. And uh, if there was, then we followed up on those as research. So it was a way to kind of break down the survey. But um, that was one source of quasars. So quasars are active galactic nuclei. And uh, they're very far away, bright radio sources, appear to be stars. Um, we were able to actually figure out that they aren't stars once Hubble came online, that Hubble was able to image these quasars and saw that they were actually galaxies that, that these were coming from. So that you could kind of get a better resolution and actually get a picture of those. So those are quasars. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to talk about today is the sun and the sun is awesome <laughs> and scary and cool. <clears throat> now, solar activity, um, and I'll just kind of pause real quick and just recap for people. Uh, we are going to kind of maybe not fill this full hour. I got some feedback that uh, the full hour was a little bit hard to um, for people to be able to catch all of it. So we're going to condense it down. And starting next week, we're going to start doing Astronomy 101 classes in half hour increments. There's no college credit, <laughs> but if you've always wanted to take Astronomy 101, uh, that's what we're going to start doing and we'll record them and post them and everything. And uh, yeah, we, we love Hubble and we love our astronomy picks. If you missed it, I, from two weeks ago, our video is on my YouTube about Hubble and we got some cool images from that as well. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the sun where, uh, and what solar activity necessarily is and what it what it means. So to get from there, <laughs> yeah, 
30 minutes is easy for a lot of people and then you have time to digest it. So the sun is basically superheated plasma. Um, I think, yeah, DTG said a miasma of incandescent plasma. I think that that's, that's appropriate. Now, uh, in the center of the sun, we have hydrogen fusing into helium. When that happens, it releases uh, radiation that sort of makes its way through this plasma. Um, plasma is just another type of matter. So when we talk about, uh, you have solid, liquid, gas, and then plasma. Plasma is usually kind of not taught at the super kid level because kids don't have a reference point for plasma and you don't want to create that. <laughs> so, um, the, uh, but plasma is really a fourth state of matter. And it's just, if you took that gas and you superheat it and it ionizes and it looks, it's scary, <laughs> uh, but it, but it's a form of matter. And uh, as you know, this surface has all this plasma that's going on. We see these things called sunspots and sunspots don't look directly at the sun, but you can actually see with a solar telescope, even kind of a basic solar telescope, even if you had like those, the pin box things that, you know, you can make a hole and look through a box and shine it. Uh, there's lots of cool tutorials online for how to do that. If the sun has significant sunspots on there, you can even see those that you just see these dark points on the sun. Um, so what are sunspots? A lot of it has to come from the fluid dynamics of the plasma. So we have this superheated gas. You can kind of see the zoomed in part on the right that it like looks like this churning and bubbling here. Um, it's a lot of like fluid dynamics and it's all ionized and really hot. So you get a lot of like magnetism that's going on here. Um, so that's a good question. Can there be a cool plasma? I think it just depends on your definition of cool and it depends on what gas you're using. So they're all going to have sort of different temperatures at which something will become a plasma. And I know things like welding torches and stuff kind of air on that edge um, of being technically a plasma. And uh, so there are different quantities where we, we could uh, say, yes, it's a plasma. Like you have an ionized gas, but it's relatively cool compared to like the temperature of the sun. Um, sorry, I don't have specifics. I'll try to dig some up and, um, and share those on my Twitter, but that's a really good question. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, that's a good, that's a good one. So ion trails, maybe, I mean, it's a, it just really depends on how, how we strictly define it. Um, but that's a really good question. But for the sun, we're talking about superheated plasma here. And as it's turning, we do have fluid dynamics that are happening here. And because it's ionized and what I mean by ionized is that it has a charge essentially. Uh, so that positive or negative, if we remember, um, and you have a magnet will have a positive and negative side. Um, you do start to get some magnetism that happens. And here you can see this zoomed in part of a sunspot. The, the really dark part we call umbra, the sort of grayer part where you see the swirly bits, uh, that's what we call the penumbra of a sunspot. And they come in pairs. Sometimes it's easier to see that they, one is that their pairs are not, um, but they do come in pairs and it's essentially a North pole and a South pole. And you get this arcing that's happening, um, because you, we basically created a magnet. So sunspots are magnets that occur over time due to the rotation of the sun. Now I don't have an image for this, but bear with me here. Imagine a rotating ball, right? If it's solid and it's spinning, you have the, you know, bit at the center is going to be spinning faster than the bit at the top. And there's a great Calvin and Hobbes comic about uh, rotation speeds and everything. And it does start to break people's brain, but it's just angular momentum that we're talking about. But, um, you know, because the ball is solid, you're able to do that. Um, but if this ball is not solid, if for example, it's like a fluidy plasma thing, then even though it's spinning, you're going to have different rotation rates. And, uh, yeah, that causes things like Coriolis forces that, you know, we have in our atmosphere. 
All of that stuff is due to these rotations when you have a fluid. Maybe you can think of if you've played with um, those big cool balls at a science museum that have like liquid on the inside that looks really pretty and shimmery and you spin it and then you can see all the different parts spin at different speeds. It's kind of like that. And over time, because you have these different rotation rates, the magnetic bits and the plasma bits start to kind of spin up and coalesce. And you think about it a little bit like a rubber band. Um, so what happens is we get these points, and actually there have been points of a lot of solar activity, which we mean there's a lot of sunspots, where you actually do see two bands that are on the sun, sort of about midway north and midway south, where you see a lot of dots. And it's just because you have this rotating ball of plasma that has started to twist and churn and build these magnets out of these positive and negative charged particles. Um, but once you have those, once you have these sunspots, they continue to kind of keep building and keep building because you have all this churning activity that's happening. And uh, let me see if I, we can go back to that other picture. Um, yeah, this one. So this is um, super enhanced image, but instead of being dark, uh, if you are to look at these sunspots in think ultraviolet in other frequencies, but definitely ultraviolet, you'll see it look more like this where those dark spots are actually really bright. Um, and it's because they're higher, higher energy. All of the energy in this spot is being boosted up to a higher frequency. So you can only see it up in ultraviolet or x-ray frequencies. And, uh, and that big sort of band that we're looking at is the connection between a north pole sunspot and a south pole sunspot. And you get these magnetic fields. If you've ever played with a magnet and those like iron filament things and you stick it on there and then you see the field lines, that's kind of what's happening here. Um, so yes and no. Um, they, if you're talking about that right in that center of the sunspot, then it's a little bit cooler just because it's ejected so much plasma that that plasma is going around. But that ejection is this bit that you're seeing up in the higher frequencies. Um, at the core of a star or gas giant, when the gas be almost solid because of gravitational forces. Um, that's a really good question. And essentially, yes, in the same way that like, um, the core of gas giants, like you said, it, Jupiter or Saturn um, will be like, you know, we've heard metallic hydrogen. It's just so dense that it's kind of like a solid, but then it's superheated and ionized. And so this is kind of the hard part. There are entire fields in solar physics just because we can't recreate it here on Earth in a lab. So it's trying to figure out actually what the physics is like in the center of the sun. We can guess based on the physics that we know, but it requires, it's a lot, it's a whole field of study. So, um, but these solar flares, as you, as you get these bands that are building between the north and the south, over time they will start to build up and they build up and they build up and you get a lot of sort of tension. The best analogy to think of is if you took that north pole and the south pole and it was a rubber band and you're twisting it and you're twisting it and you're twisting it and you're twisting it and eventually it's going to break. Now from that, that's where we get solar flares, these big bursts of energy that come out. Um, before I jump into solar flares, here's just kind of a chart. Some people may have seen this before, that th this solar cycle of sunspots, um, it happens on a regular cycle because you get these sunspots that form due to that you know, fluid dynamic plasma that's happening, and then they burst and then the sunspots disappear and then it forms again. And so you have this whole cycle that's going on that's about every 11 years. And, uh, and it can be modeled through just literally counting the sunspots. And it just has to do with um, as it builds up from the rotation and then it releases all this energy. And we think there is a super cycle too, that there's another cycle on top of this, um, but it just requires a lot of observation. So that's, that's a, a well-founded theory, um, but we don't necessarily have as many 
observational details as we do here. Um, so when sunspots happen, you get this huge burst of energy that heads towards us. Um, yeah, we need our time traveler to do that. And when that breaks, when you have your north and south and the rubber band and it's twisted and it's twisted and it's twisted and it's finally reached its breaking point and it actually snaps and breaks, you get this huge burst of plasma that shoots towards us or out into space. And it's, and it's a lot. And it's a lot. And uh, so solar flares happen fairly regularly. Again, with that cycle that if you have a lot of sunspots, you're going to get a lot of solar flares coming off of it. And it's just spitting off into space left and right. Awesome images with this stuff. Um, what happens if a solar flare hits us? Now, we have a magnetic field because we have a molten iron core in our planet that creates a magnetic field that protects us from most of the solar wind. These jets, these solar flares that happen, do contain ionized plasma. They contain high radiation. It's a ton of energy that flies to us um, and charged particles. These charged particles sometimes get trapped in our magnetic field and spin up and follow the magnetic lines and then hit our north and south poles. And that is um, like the north uh, the aurora borealis. Um, so you see more sort of northern and southern lights corresponding with a lot more solar activity. There's a correlation there. And, uh, but what, how, how bad could it be? <laughs> Let's do the apocalyptic scenario. Um, I love this. So solar flares do hit us occasionally. Um, normally it's not too bad because it, sometimes it just corresponds with maybe a little bit more northern or southern lights. Sometimes it will hit electronics satellites and we do get a little bit of like static, you know, cause it's just been hit basically with an electromagnetic pulse that <laughs> just came from the sun and hit our satellites and kind of fritz a little bit and, and go back out and then they're fine. Um, but sometimes bad things happen. And, uh, in 1859, there was a solar flare that happened called the Carrington solar event. And this was like a super duper solar flare that it burst and it went boom and earth was right in the path of it. And it came and it just hit our atmosphere. It burned through a lot of stuff. There were, uh, this was 1859. So a little industrial, like we had telegraph machines. Um, there were power plants. There was so transformers in power plants. There was these huge transformers just shattered. Like they just, they were hit with this electromagnetic pulse and they just fried, um, completely obliterated. There's also anecdotes that the, um, telegraph operators. So remember the telegraph actually got shocked from this surge that went through the system and it actually physically shocked them and, uh, set fire to the telegraph paper when they got hit with his solar flare. And this was 1859. So there was not a lot of technology, but what technology was there was not great. <laughs> it didn't survive super well from that. Um, but <laughs> if that, <laughs> it's awesome. If that were to happen to us today, I mean, we'd be in big trouble. There was one in, funny enough, 2012, that we missed by weeks that cause sun's here, earth's here. We go around the sun, right? We passed by and then one went poof. And uh, if that had hit us, that was at the level of the Carrington event. I mean, okay, it was eight, seven, eight years ago now. So we'd be maybe crawling out of it, but it would have been at least a few years of fried systems, fried systems. Um, oh, between every, everything, particle collider, everything. I mean, you'd have, so the good thing is, is that you'd have things like particle colliders, really sensitive, you know, like military stuff are incredibly shielded both from stuff getting out, stuff getting in and from power surges. So you would hope that they would be strong enough to resist a massive power surge like that. Problem is, is that then the power would all have gone out 
And so you'd hope that your generators survived and um, that you'd have enough power to keep powering. Um, yeah, the BiPAP machine. It, it, I mean, it's amazing how reliant we are on technology to actually think about it. It's Friday, so if you haven't poured yourself a drink, <laughs> this might be a good time. Uh, but we did miss it, and they are rare. And and thankfully, I mean, one happened in 1859, so our odds, you know, if you just want to talk about purely, like, 100-year floodplain type odds, then um, at least one has hit us in the sort of industrial era. <laughs> uh, but, you know, this is, a, this is a field of study, and it's a fun, fun way to think about this stuff. Um, oh, that's a good question. Did it cause cancers or other illnesses? Yeah, that's hard to say because um, in terms of illness, like immediate illnesses or like radiation poisoning or anything, probably not. Cancers, I think we would, I'm not up to speed on my medical history to know how much we knew about cancer back in the late 19th century. Um, and I mean, genuinely, the, uh, the magnetic field on Earth protects us from those high radiation particles pretty well. It's the electronics that are getting fried by this electromagnetic pulse that's going through, but it's not like sustained radiation that would cause much biological damage to us. Y if you were outside, you'd prob I mean, you'd get a high dose of like ultraviolet radiation, so you might get a bad sunburn that happened there. Um, but it's one of these that, you know, it happens and it passes through and, uh, would be a big surge on it. But that's a, that's a really good question. I haven't thought about that before. Um, I like that a lot. So yeah, that's your, that's your space apocalypse story <laughs> to end the week on. But yeah, so solar flares, these big, yeah, again, just think of sunspots as like two points of, ma of a magnetic field. They twist up like rubber bands. Eventually it breaks. It spits all this energy out towards us and um, and hits us. So, like I said, <laughs> we did 40 minutes. So, I, you know, I'm happy to, to sit here uh, as long as people have questions. If you have any more questions, feel free to uh, throw them my way. But those are the two kind of big things that I wanted to talk about. The quasars, active galactic nuclei. All right, bring it on a science question. Bring it on. Let's do it, Billy. <laughs> um, is, type as fast as you can. Um, but yeah, quasars, if you weren't here at the beginning, active galactic nuclei from old, old, faraway galaxies that shine bright like stars. And, uh, and we use them for studying old galaxies as well as using them as background light for studying stuff between us and them. Oh, God, Billy, thank you. Oh, man, I completely missed that. Yeah, so, <laughs> yes, there was a discovery. Thank you. I had a few people send this to me. Oh, fail on my part. So, yes, there was a recently announced discovery of a black hole that is close to us. Close being a thousand light years away. <laughs> so, um, essentially what we discovered is a star system that has a star that is orbiting nothing. And I think that there's a third, like there's a, a bigger star that's going around that. And uh, so you had this star that's essentially in space just doing this. Like, well, that's weird. <laughs> and and uh, that's where we stand. I mean, that's basically what we discovered is that there's a star that's orbiting a companion that has a companion that we can't detect. So we think it's a supermassive, or not a supermassive, we think it's a stellar mass black hole. That maybe it was a binary star system. And I saw your question, Andrew, I'll come back to that. Um, that it was a binary star system and one of those stars died, went supernova. Uh, and we know it would have gone supernova to result in a black hole. And then that other star is still happily there orbiting. That is rare. Um, we don't see a lot of those. I don't think that breaks any understanding of our physics. The reason it's rare is because um, typically when you have stars that form in binary systems, which is most stars, they're very close to each other and they both came from very dense gas clouds. And so one got massive enough to go through its life cycle, died quickly, became a black hole. The other one 
is not as massive, so it's still going through its life, but they're close enough that the material is falling off of this star and accreting onto the black hole. And so we see that in the X-ray and Chandra telescope has detected a lot of those. Um, but the, uh, but this case, it's kind of like whatever happened to the star system happened and then was done and it just stopped like it, that black hole. There's no more material falling into it. Um, so we're not seeing any radiation, at least I don't, from the stuff I saw, it doesn't look like we can detect anything going around it that's falling into it that would give off heat. We just see a star orbiting another black star, essentially. Um, and so we think that that's a stellar mass black hole. But just really cool discovery. And yeah, it was one of those things where it's like, there's a black hole near us. And then you look at the numbers and uh, <laughs> yeah, um, it's a thousand light years away. So still, we're, we're going to be okay. Um, <laughs> so how close is too close for a black hole to us? That's a great question. Um, just to carry on with the black holes and then... Um, Actually, yeah, let me answer Andrew's question first because it dis before it disappears too far up. But the question is if Mars could have lost its magnetic field because the core cooled too quickly and it stopped rotating, that's one of the theories for why Mars doesn't have a magnetic field is that Mars is half the size of Earth. So if you took two loaves of bread out of the oven, one was half the size of the other, the one that's smaller would cool off a lot faster. So that was that's the theory behind that. Um, the other theory is that uh, Hellas Planitia, this huge crater on the south hemisphere of Mars, uh, uh, something crashed into it and cracked the other side. And that's where we have Mariner Valley and Olympus Mons and all the volcanoes. So they think maybe something, this is my theory, my favorite theory, something cracked into it and then broke it and disrupted the internal core that made the magnetic field disappear. But it's a really good question. Um, so in terms of the how close is too close, it depends on the size of the black hole. But we have to remember black holes are just deep gravitational wells. So it depends on the mass because the mass is going to dictate how deep that this is. Um, oh yeah, good. And I have, I think two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I think I have one on Mars. I'll try to find it and link to it as too, where we talk about it a little bit more. This is a great question. I don't mind it at all. Um, but the, uh, it just depends on how massive it is. If our sun at its mass turned into a black hole, so just one solar mass black hole, we'd have problems from lack of radiation, but our star would, or our orbit would remain completely the same because that's its gravitational well. So if it just got deep enough that it was a black hole, but it would still be such that out where we are, we would still orbit it totally normally. And I think that's just a misconception from when we talk about black holes that we think about them as giant vacuum cleaners or hoovers that are just like going through sucking stuff up all around space. Really, they're just deep gravitational wells that stuff can't escape out of. So things like this, like a, a solar mass-ish black hole that's orbiting another star, that's just their star system, right? That's not necessarily like gonna suck that star up and then come and, and suck up. I mean, we love our apocalyptic images of space, <laughs> but, um, but black holes are actually fairly benign. And the ones that we see out there we're starting to detect a lot more thanks to LIGO and detecting gravitational waves because we're detecting that black holes that have no other radiation that have just long, stars that have long since died resulted in a black hole and these black holes are just out in space. We don't know how many are out there. We have no way of seeing them, but now we can detect them if they're colliding due to gravitational waves. So. Good, Homer. I'm glad I can make you a little less stressed out about black holes. Um, I mean, yeah, so if one was even like the mass of our sun, you know, our sun's gravitational field extends to about one light year. It is, uh, our, you know, trying to wrap our head around how massive things are and how much... <laughs> like, for example, the image on the screen right now is not to scale and could be misleading. <laughs> for the size ratio from sun to planet. But the mass of our sun is, it's massive, it's huge. 
and its gravitational well extends out to about one light year. That's where our Oort cloud is. That's where comets come from. Um, and so if a, you know, and then the closest star to us from that is about four light years away from us. And I use the analogies. It's like, it's having an orange in LA and an orange in Denver. That's like how big to how far away they are. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, Philly, I know that. And it's like, it's weird. It's weirdly small. And yeah, anyway. Um, so to have a stellar, even a stellar mass black hole that is zipping through, that would be any danger to us. We wouldn't necessarily see it and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be any danger. That would, that would be so weird and random to happen. I mean, we're never going to say never, but never is in 99.9999999% sure a black hole is not going to come by and be close enough to actually disrupt our gravitational orbits at all. I mean, it'd be kind of cool if it did because space is awesome <laughs> and scary. Uh, but yeah, so that's that. Any other questions? Any last questions we had? I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it's a great Futurama quote. Don't cry, Bender. No one really knows what happens in a black hole. <laughs> it's possible, possible she's still alive in another dimension. I love it. Awesome. All right. There are any last questions? We can kind of wrap things up. Oh, I, if there are any, I'll kind of give people some time. Um, okay. Bring it on. Uh, but... I will say I mentioned like stellar mass black holes versus supermassive black holes. The ones in the centers of galaxies are supermassive black holes. Um, the ones that are left over from when a star dies, a super, a massive star dies is just called a stellar mass black hole. So we have like these two types of black holes and, uh, and even though a star has to be super massive in order to die and result in a black hole, uh, it's still going to eject a lot of material. So what's left behind is about the mass of two, four, ten stars. It's still not a ton. Um, okay. So first question is nothing escapes a black hole. Really absolutely nothing, even dark matter. Good question. We don't know for sure about dark matter. Um, I will. So let's talk about normal baryonic matter first. Baryonic matter just means it's from baryons. Baryonic matter is the stuff you see on a periodic table. So it's everything that we see and touch. It's made out of uh, protons, neutrons, all of those fun things that we remember from school. All of that is baryonic matter and it only makes up 4% of our universe. So baryonic matter cannot escape a black hole because it just has to do with the escape velocity required to get out of it. When we talk about traveling through space, think about your sheet of space time, drink, <laughs> trampoline analogy. Um, and any mass is going to dip that space time down a little bit. The less mass it has, the less it's going to dip. And then if it has no mass, it's coasts at the speed of light. So the speed of light for matter is the fastest anything can go. When we talk about escape velocity, we're talking about how fast you have to go to get out of a gravity well. Um, so our Earth has an escape velocity. Our sun has an escape velocity. If you want to escape a gravitational well, you have to reach a certain speed in order to get out of it. And uh, such that, you know, if you had no fuel or nothing, that you, you wouldn't just fall back in. So you have a speed think about it like if I'm throwing a baseball, right? Throw it faster, faster, faster. Eventually it's going to reach a point where it keeps going and it goes off into space. That's the escape velocity. Um, and the deeper gravitational well, the more mass the object has, the steeper that gravitational well is and the faster you have to go to crawl out of it. Eventually you're going to get more and more mass. It's going to make a steeper and steeper well. And uh, the escape velocity becomes higher and higher and higher. You have to get faster and faster to get out of it. Eventually the numbers just work that the, it's the, the speed of light or faster than the speed of light. And so no matter can actually get out of that. There's no way a normal matter can go fast enough to crawl out of the gravitational well of a black hole. Um, light has no mass. 
It is the particle we call the photon, the particle associated with electromagnetic radiation. It has no mass, so it coasts at the speed of light. Um, so even a photon can't get out of a black hole. So we have baryons, which are matter, like we know and see and touch and feel. Those can't escape. Photons can't escape because they have a fixed speed and a black hole uh, escape velocity is too high for a photon to escape. When it comes to dark matter, we don't know what dark matter is. It does react gravitationally, so we can see light being bent around something. We can see objects rotate around stuff faster than what we see is there. So there's some matter out there, and it's a lot, that has a gravitational presence but we can't actually detect or see in electromagnetic waves, which is how we've observed most of our universes with our eyes, some form of our eyes, right? Radio, X-ray, gamma ray, um, visual, any of those is all electromagnetic radiation. Dark matter has none of that. So um, we can see the gravitational effects, but we can't see anything else. So we don't know what it is or how it behaves. There's lots of theories. People thought like maybe neutrinos would account for some of the dark matter. Um, there's all sorts of things with that. So um, gravity wells are associated with any object that has mass, just deeper for more massive objects. Yes, that's absolutely true. Again, bowling ball on the trampoline. Any object that has mass is going to dip that down. And then the more massive, it's going to get deeper. Um, so yeah, that's that's a, the right way to think about it. Um, there have been theories on where dark matter is coming from. It actually accounts for almost a quarter of the stuff in our universe. Uh, baryonic matter, what we see, touch, feel, periodic table, is only 4%. Dark matter is about 25%. So it's a lot. It's a lot that's out there. And uh, we just see its gravitational presence. So think about it like a cloaked Klingon ship. <laughs> That's how I like to think about it. It's just cloaked and we can't see it, but we can see stuff being bent around it. And so that's a big area of study. And uh, that's cool. So, all right. With that, I know it's hard to ask for questions when... <laughs> right. I mean, that's, we're trying to figure out. So stellar mass and supermassive black holes. That's okay. Black hole when a star is consumed. Okay, so first qualitative difference between stellar mass and supermassive black holes. And then I'll get to Domestic's question about um, what shoots out of the top and bottom of a black hole when a star is consumed. Uh, with stellar mass and supermassive black holes, um, qualitatively, in terms of like their shape, they are, they're still, they're just black holes in the sense that they have such a steep gravity well that we can treat them like a singularity and no light can escape from them. Um, we think that stellar mass black holes, ones that were remnants of massive stars that went supernova, died, and then a black hole was left over, we think over time they merge with each other. They, you know, dynamics, you get galaxies that are merging and stuff is running into each other and eventually they merge and get bigger and bigger and bigger and migrate to the center of a galaxy and become a supermassive black hole. Now, we talked at the top of this about active galactic nuclei, which is kind of domestic's question, which is fine. Um, talking, and that has to do with what's kind of being shot out of them. So with stellar mass black holes, you're really just going to get primarily X-ray radiation if you have another star there that's sort of being consumed by that black hole. It's not going to be giving off like pain. You know, it's not going to be one of these that for hundreds of years blitzing out telescopes. It's going to be bright and it's going to be hot. And um, we do get occasional, oh, I forget what they're called, but... We do get occasional flares from these black holes as stuff is falling into them. Um, when it comes to active galactic nuclei, those are the supermassive black holes. That's a lot of stuff that's being consumed. It's not just like the gas being pulled off of one star. 
it's like a bunch of stars and a bunch of gas and just like all this stuff that's migrated to the center of the galaxy is all heating up and falling in and then shoots the stuff way off um, in different directions. Um, the, the top and bottom jets that you're talking about, that's the active galactic nuclei. And uh, that's not actually coming out of the black hole itself. It's from all the material that's falling around it. And if you remember the right hand rule in angular momentum, it's shooting out energy to account for all that spinning and all that rotation and energy that's going in this direction gets transferred out there. It's just conservation of energy and momentum um, that's causing those to happen. When they first detected quasars, when we had these bright lights, in the sky and we thought we were trying to figure out like what they, I say we, society, <laughs> scientists, were trying to figure out what they were in the 60s. One of the theories was like, well, what if it's a white hole? What if it's the other side of a black hole? Um, we were able to get a better look at them and see that they were in the center of galaxies. And so what it is, is it's just the, the heat and the radiation that's being shot off as stuff is falling into it. So again, it's not coming out of the black hole. It's just being shot off from falling in that plane. So I hope that answers your question. It's a really good question though. Um, <laughs> when you could go to, that's okay. We like going to Mars. We like going to Mars. You could go to Mars using Google Earth. Um, yeah, back in the Google Earth heyday. Uh, and there's been some awesome pictures from the Mars rovers, by the way, if you haven't looked those up, high recommend. Even if you haven't looked any, any stuff like that up, um, just Google like Mars rover selfies. <laughs> and, and it's brilliant. Now we are actually at the hour. So clearly I was over ambitious with saying I could do this in half an hour, but I'm happy to hang out and answer astronomy questions for an hour. Um, so how about we think about doing it this way? And I'm always welcome to feedback. I appreciate all of your support. Uh, but if starting next week, we start doing astronomy 101 and we do that for half an hour and then we, yeah. And see, bat cat's way ahead of me. Thank you. Um, 30 minute Q and A. I think that that sounds brilliant. So we'll do a 30 minute class, a 30 minute Q and A. I'll post them all online so you can check them out there. Again, um, I'll post all these to my YouTube channel. Um, so I want to thank everyone for hanging out. Happy Friday afternoon. Uh, you're watching here live on Twitch. Don't forget to uh, hit follow so you can see when I come live next. Even if you weren't chatting, I appreciate you hanging out here with us because it's always really fun. And if you do have Amazon Prime, you can subscribe to my channel for a month for free. Uh, you're not locked into anything, so it's just a, a nice thing that you can do. You can check that out. If you're watching this after the fact on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe so I can keep doing this stuff because that's how it keeps me, uh, helps me continue to bring you this content. So um, please feel free to reach out anytime. I'm very happy. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I love answering all of your questions. Uh, you can find all my social media links and everything else down there, down below. And I will be back on Sunday to do our casual Star Trek brunch, talking about sort of the next, I think, six episodes of TNG. So I think nine through 14, 15, possibly I'll post on my, on my Twitter, what we're doing there. Then, uh, still waiting for the, the patron vote closes tonight to figure out what we're going to watch for our, uh, science of sci-fi episode club on Tuesday. And I will be streaming games in the interim here on Twitch. So anyway, thank you all very much. Go get up, stretch, have a glass of water. You, let your let your brain relax for a little bit, and send me any questions that uh, that come your way that you think of. So, thank you again for hanging out. I hope you all have a nice Friday. Live long and prosper. <laughs> Space rules. Bye.